Today I'd like to talk about the sacraments as part of holiness. And instead of a prayer, I'm going to start with a quote. And this is the quote. And I have to admit, I don't know where I got it from. Our life experiences make up our experience of God. Our experience of God makes up our faith in God. Our faith in God makes up our wholeness in God. Our wholeness in God makes up the ground of our being. And the ground of our being is what truly makes us holy. Uh, The reason why I chose that is because in talking about the sacraments, they are very much a real part of holiness of life or the journey. And we're talking about, in this series, the journey of the spiritual life. And that journey is what makes us holy and enables us to continue to do the walking in the footsteps of Christ through times of distress, tragedy, etc. Now, this may be a review for many of you, but it's we're going to walk through the seven sacraments, but I want to give you an emphasis on them, not in terms of who and what they are, but what they encourage us to do and to be. And that means uh, to live the sacramental life as much as we can each day in our lives. This way we utilize the sacrament for its grace and its benefits. One of the things uh, over the years that I've discovered about the sacraments is a parallel, in a sense, the psychological stages of development that Eric Erickson Uh, developed. So I'm going to allude to some of that, and uh, we'll go from there. I have the category of the sacraments broke down in three um, areas, which you're familiar with. Sacraments of initiation, sacraments of healing, and sacraments of vocation. Let's look at the three sacraments of initiation. Baptism, Eucharist, and Confirmation. And you can find a reference to all of these uh, in Scripture. And that's very important to to do. Uh, Baptism. We all know that baptism incorporates us into the family of God. And it's very important. I know most of us When we're baptized as children, we don't think of that. But as I listen to other speakers nowadays, they talk a little bit about the need for us to go and look at the sacraments, especially baptism, and see what that did for us and what is, we might say, the consequence of our receiving it. So baptism makes us part of the family of God. And it does that by the means of pouring out of water, saying the words, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. But at the end of the rite of baptism, and I think it's optional, but I think many priests and deacons use it, is the phrase of feta. And to me, that's where the commissioning of each person comes in. May Jesus touch your ears to receive the word and your mouth to proclaim his faith to the praise and glory of God. Now just think about that. And when we look back at the graces of baptism, making us a child of God, in a sense, we are commissioned by uh, hearing the word 
and then most importantly, to proclaim that word with our lips for the glory of God. I don't think there are many times that uh, we remember this. And uh, that's why baptism is often, I received it, but now I don't remember what it means. But what it does mean is that we are invited to hear the word and to speak that word from our hearts to others. So that you might say that's the commission of the sacrament of baptism. To hear the word, then to preach it uh, to other people. How do we preach that? By word and by example. We don't have to stand on a street corner and top of a soapbox or a milk carton, crate rather. We do it by the lifestyle that we have. And that helps us being very conscious of the baptismal sacrament, the baptismal promises that were made on our behalf to love God, to serve Him always in our life. I want to talk about the Eucharist, since that's the order in which we receive them, and we'll come back to confirmation, which in a sense completes the sacrament of baptism. The Eucharist is the food for our journey. There's no other way of saying it better than that. It is sharing in the body and blood of Jesus. And as Catholics, we believe firmly and strongly that the Eucharist that Christ gave us is real. In other words, it is his body and blood, soul and divinity, to be food for our journey as believers in Christ Jesus. That comes about when the the consecration takes place of the bread and the wine with the words, this is my body, this is my blood. And then the commission, you might say, is do this in remembrance of me. Remember Jesus gave the bread and the wine, as his body and blood to his apostles, and then invited them to do it in commemoration of him. And what did that mean? When every time you gather together with the faith community, you break the bread, you drink the wine, you are remembering the body and blood of Christ Jesus. That has consequences. Because once we receive that body and blood, we go forth and give testimony about our faith. And we are able to do that simply because the Eucharist is the food for our uh, ability to testify to the faith. Young Carlo Acutis, just beatified, used to say that the Eucharist was his highway to heaven. And you know when you get on a highway, you don't necessarily get off it too soon. And uh, I think his image is great in the sense that when we share in the Eucharist, we are journeying most intimately with Christ. As the two apostles on the road to Emmaus found out, when they sat down with Jesus to eat, he took the bread, blessed it, broke it, and gave it to them. And the phrase that's most important is, were not our hearts on fire when he opened to us the scriptures. If we want to understand the mystery of the Eucharist, we should read about its institution in the Gospels. And we should also read about the implications of it when we read John chapter 6. Third sacrament as part of our initiation is that of confirmation. Confirmation is accepting and becoming of an adult person in the church. We say adult or a young person in the church. It's based on 
the bishop extending his hands and also anointing us with chrism oil. It's the prayer of the new. It's the prayer of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. One way of looking at that is to read Acts and 1 Corinthians and also Isaiah. What is the commission of confirmation? To receive the Holy Spirit. How many times in our daily lives do we advert to the fact that what we've been able to do uh, comes from our connection to the Holy Spirit? Many times uh, people say to me, I don't know where that phrase came from. I don't know what, uh, how I did what I did. And they forget that they received the sacrament of confirmation and they're using that the gifts of the confirmation to help them minister to God's people as well as ministering to themselves. That's very important for each one of us. So, the commission, you might say, is receive the Holy Spirit. Gifts are freely given to us, but they are given to us with the idea that we use the gifts. Um, there are several things that are necessary for a gift to be worthwhile. One is that it is given to us by somebody with some thought and purpose, which are, are the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Secondly, we are invited to receive the gifts, which means you have to acknowledge that these gifts are within you, the seven signs of the sacrament of confirmation. And the third most important thing is that the gifts are used up. You know, we often receive gifts in our life and sometimes we put them on shelves and forget about them. Confirmation is not that kind of gift. It's a gift intended to be used in our life and ministry as a servant of God. So there's the three sacraments, baptism, Confirmation and Eucharist. And they always have something behind them for us to do in order to keep that sacrament not only alive within us, but useful to us in our life. No matter who we are, whether we're a lay person working out in the vineyard or we're a religious or a priest uh, ministering to God's people. So it's important to use the, that sacrament. And if we're looking at the ages of development of people, we can see baptism comes early on. The first age of a child is trust versus mistrust, but it's also the virtue of hope. And that happens... Uh, the first year and a half of life. Second time is a year and a half to three years old, autonomy versus shame. We want to will, we learn to do things and we choose to do things. Maybe not perfectly because we're learning, but at least our will has been formed and the utility of the will is to do what God asks of us. The th third stage of development is initiative. We begin to act with purpose. And that's the basic virtue of, the, of that stage. Between three and five, we begin to know what we are doing and why we are doing it. And we choose to uh, live with that in our lives. The fourth stage is industry, competency, between ages of 5 and 12. That's a big jump, but it's, those are the formative years in which we put into action our trust, our autonomy, our initiative, and we become competent in what we are saying and what we are doing. And this is very important 
for us in ministering to people as well as maintaining a holy way of life. So that's the first part of this, the sacraments of initiation. Keeping in mind that baptism, Eucharist, and confirmation form us, bring us closer and closer into the ministry of Christ, of Christ within us. The second group that I want to talk about is the sacrament of initiation. Sorry, sacrament of healing. The two sacraments of healing are penance and the sacrament of the sick. A lot is being spoken these days about the sacrament of penance, the need to forgive. And we find that in uh, the scriptures very easily. And in the sacrament of penance, we are sharing in the mercy of God and the healing power of God. It's telling of our sins to the priest, seeking forgiveness, and in, where necessary, absolution. And the words that are very consoling, I absolve you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Many years I was privileged to give missions and parishes in our diocese. I've done probably over 30 of them in different parishes. And one of the greatest movements, you might say, is that after the mission talk and the liturgy, I go to the confessional. And at that time, people come to unload stuff that has been on their minds for sometimes 10, 20, and I've had people 40 and 50 years away from the church who come back at a time like that. And that is sharing in the mercy and the healing power of God. God is always ready to forgive, to heal, and to share mercy. And what does the commission of that sacrament come down to? After we have gone through the healing process and the mercy of God, the priest can say to us, go in peace and proclaim to the world the wonderful work of God who brought you your salvation. Keep that in mind, that yes, the sacrament of penance, sometimes called the sacrament of reconciliation, sometimes called confession, is a time when we share fully and completely in the mercy of God. And as, <laughs> as a consequence of that, we are able to share mercy with others. It is a sad thing when somebody can be forgiven and not forgive others. The more we are healed of our weaknesses or sinfulness, the freer we become to uh, forgive and to heal others. I remember, and I think I told this story before, that there was a man at a funeral, and he was sitting in the front row, and he was crying throughout the service. And at the end of the service, the priest said to him, what is the matter? Can I help you? Is this person a relative of yours that we are praying for today? And he said, yes, he's my brother. And uh, the priest said, oh, this must be a great loss for you. And he said, I have not spoken to him for 50 years. And it was over something very minute. He couldn't even remember. This is the sad part of it. Couldn't even remember why they hadn't spoken. But they did not. The effect of penance gives us the grace and the courage not only to have ourselves forgiven, but in that process, given the gift, you might say, the ability to forgive others. Uh, there's nothing worse than the inability to take the sacrament and to share it in one some way or another with another person, especially those in our families or close friends who have hurt us over the years. We must be ready to forgive, to heal, 
and to uh, comfort them in their sorrow. The second sacrament of healing is that of the sick. Fortunately, in recent years, we have divided that sacrament so that it can be received more often. The sacrament of the sick, or called the anointing of the sick, can be done when somebody is elderly and sickly at home or in a uh, nursing home. The second time is when a person is going in for surgery uh, to give them the comfort of God's healing presence. And the third time is the journey to uh, the next life, time of death. So the sacrament gives us strength and grace at times of we of sickness and of death. And that's very consoling. In my recent years, since I'm a little older, I have received that sacrament several times, both because of my age and because of the surgeries I've gone through. It is a great consolation to know that the Lord is with you no matter what. And you're not answering to anybody but to God. And so the Lord who knows all things is able to strengthen us and give us the grace in time of sickness and in death. And how is that exemplified? By anointing with the oil of the sick. In ancient times, pouring oil on wounds was seen as a very uh, helpful and even medicinal thing to do. So that anointing with the oil... And for those who are sick, say living uh, in a nursing home or confined, you can receive that sacrament several times. And that's the beauty of it, that God comes to us in this anointing of the sick. Uh, As we grow older and perhaps are in a nursing home or needing nursing care, that sacramental oil placed upon our forehead, helps us to endure the pain and the suffering of the aging process. And finally, it is used in the sacrament of the dying. It is a prayer for the sick, prayer for the dying, and it's a prayer for the dead. Keeping that in mind, uh, we remember this phrase from the right of anointing of the sick, bring man or woman to eternal life, first promised to him and or her in baptism. Notice what happens. We go around a full circle. We talk about baptism at the beginning of life to give us faith, to give us strength to walk in the journey with Christ. The sacrament of the sick, especially of the dying, brings us back to our baptism in the fulfillment of promise for those who walk with Christ to be comforted, consoled, and yes, made it made easier to accept the next phase of life, which is the journey to God our Father. As a priest, I've witnessed many times when people are anointed, either because of grave sickness or because they are near death. And I have seen the change in the people once they receive that sacrament, because often they receive it with the Eucharist. And that is a great gift to them in their hour of sadness, you might say, but in their hour of preparing to face God for all eternity. So those two sacraments, the healing uh, is the sacrament of penance or reconciliation or confession, if you want to call it that, and the sacrament of the sick. In other words, we are always able to be healed along life's journey. And I've jumped ahead, a bit, but Erickson's seventh stage is... Uh, create generativity and care hits us between 40 and 65 and that's an important sacrament 
to uh, this important age in our life. That's when most of us really come to the peak of our life in work, as in family, and in service to others. Also, another stage there that we're all aware of is what's called ego integrity. In other words, I now know fully and completely who I am, what I've been doing, and what I can expect to happen. And that brings about the gift of wisdom in our lives. And that's for people theoretically 65 or older. I'm glad I finally reached that. So uh, it's an important process. We are constantly in need of healing in our lives, whether it's directly from the church or for, from others. And remember, the ability to forgive others, I believe, is proportionate to the ability to forgive yourself of your own wrongdoing. People who have difficulty uh, forgiving themselves or coming to terms with their uh, infidelities, you might say, uh, if they don't come to terms, then that's very hard to forgive others. Keep that in mind. That's a very strong thing. <coughs> Excuse me. The last two sacraments we talk about is the sacrament of vocation. These sacraments reflect the call to life, call to how we're going to serve God's people. First one is marriage. It's the two becoming one in the body of Christ. I think that's very important. The sacrament itself is conferred not by the priest, but by the couple to each other in the exchange of marriage vows. Uh, We sometimes forget that marriage is a covenant, not a contract. Contract is a legal way of looking at things and can sometimes be broken. A covenant is a bonding together of two people, the two becoming one in the eyes of Christ, the eyes of the church, and the eyes of the world. Couples are given a very unique grace at the time of that sacrament. Uh, Again, I often tell people in marriage preparation, do not forget to call upon God in the times of your joy in marriage, but also in times of sorrow. Uh, And you receive the strength to endure the hardships and difficulties of life, as well as the blessings. If you look at the sacrament of marriage as a gift from God that takes two people, joins them together as one in the body of Christ. Jesus is always with you. Uh, This is very important. And this helps us around uh, intimacy, which is the sixth stage of uh, Erickson. And the virtue of his intimacy is love between the ages of 18 and 40. And that's very important. What's the commission? The last words that the priest says in the rite of marriage is close to what God has joined together. No one must divide. Now what does that mean? The grace of the sacrament is such that helps us if we've entered it properly to stay together in good times and bad, in sickness and in health, till death do us part. Uh, And that's a very important aspect of marriage. I've sadly, divorce is on the rise, and people sometimes, um, unfortunately many times, when they get to the point of a difficulty in their marriage, what do they do? They walk out. They run away. They don't want to face it. Facing 
troubles in marriage is a way of spiritual growth. Think about that. The ability to face situations of difficulty in marriage is an, ability, an opportunity for great spiritual growth. It could be in the birth of children. It could be at a time of stress due to job and family. It could be at any time in the marriage. But you don't run away from it. It's a covenant. Covenant means you are bonded together. So instead of running away, you sit down and you say, let's talk about this. Let's work this through. And that's part of the growth. When you enter marriage, it is an opportunity for one person to be aided in their spiritual growth by another person. And that's very important to keep that in mind. Marriage is based on love. Love that is, yes, natural to supernatural. Love that is spiritual by which through your marriage you help each other to grow. I think one of the uh, wonderful things that I've discovered uh, dealing with married couples are those who say, I have grown in my relationship with God through my relationship with my spouse. But that's wonderful. And yes, I do hear the other side. I have difficulties and anxieties. My spouse, <coughs> my spouse is not willing or ready to help me. So keeping in mind that if you properly, and this is one of the toughest things these days, give a thought to entering marriage with a proper thought process. It's not something you do on the spur of the moment. It is something you engage for a while in order that you get to know one another, your strengths, your weaknesses, your gifts, and your opportunities. When you realize all of that, then you become more and more able to marry one another and to live with one another now and forever. It's very important. Marriage is the fruit of people's love for each other with the blessing of God and the church. The last sacrament is holy orders. And what I've said about uh, marriage can also come into play with holy orders, priests, religious life, etc., by accepting holy orders, a person is sharing in the priesthood of Jesus Christ. This is done, if you notice, by the bishop with the imposition of hands and the anointing with chrism. And the most important part of this is the power, the prayer of consecration as a priest. So that brings us to the... Um, mission of the priest. It's all tied up, and I don't have room to give it to you, but in the prayer of consecration. In other words, what happens to a person when they desire and become a priest? First of all, they, the desire, they must be in touch, touch with uh, what is God asking of me? And for that matter of fact, all Christians each day, in a sense, must see that what is happening is what God is asking us to do. And for the priest, in a very special way, to be available to God's people. Uh, that's one of the things that I have to tell you a story about. And it happened well over... 50 years ago, when I was a young priest, we had people come in, married couples, clergy from other religions, talking to youth. And I remember the meeting was about 60 kids, and there was an open discussion about the various things that happens in married life, single life, and priestly life. Uh, and they locked the rectory door. No. Now, we're not supposed to be working to the point that we uh, drop dead, in a sense. But at the same time, sometimes when priests tell me, oh, I finish at a certain time, 
availability is a gift. And that's one of the things we have to realize. That accepting ordination is a gift to God's people. And that gift, like every gift, can must be given, must be received, and must be used. And I have been very privileged, and I hope many other priests are, to be used for God's purpose in life. Uh, people understand the mysteries of their own life. And the only way he can do that is by prayer through the understanding of the mysteries of his own life. There's a lot more that could be said on priesthood, and we might save that for another time. But now you have the seven sacraments as a way of journeying in holiness. And what are some of the characteristics of that journey beginning with birth up to old age? Just, I'm just going to give you these words. Hope, will, purpose, competency, fidelity, love, care, and wisdom. Now think about those words, especially when you look at a young person, a little baby. You have hope that that child will grow up and uh, make their contribution in the place of the world, and that their will will be the will of God in their lives. And that hope and that will gives them purpose in order to minister to other people. And through that purpose, they develop a competency to be a minister and a missionary for God's holy people. And that helps them to remain faithful to what God has called them to do. So that their mission in life, the priestly ministry, becomes a great act of love at all times. Because they care for their people, and through their prayer, they come to a greater wisdom of God in their own life. There's a whole lot that is, is involved in the stages of development, as well as the seven sacraments. So keep in mind that God has given us these gifts to uh, work and live in the world of which we are a part today. Do we have time for more? You do? I'd like to just, now this is a little bit more complicated, but I'd like to go through the sacraments one more time in terms of peace and justice. And maybe this will help us understand. Priests and ministers, religious, who are willing to give their lives for others in peace and justice is because they've come to terms with the grace of the sacrament. For example, baptism. No one can enter into God's kingdom without being born again of water and the Holy Spirit. I believe that baptism reflects the right to life, natural life and spiritual life. And when we are conscious of that, we respect all human beings from conception to natural death. If we're not accurate in that, we impose, uh, we support those who would take life through abortion, capital punishment, assisted suicide, and euthanasia. So you see the sacrament has a great effect in our lives. The Eucharist, take this and eat it. This is my body, drink, for this is my blood. The Eucharist is food for the journey in life. As a member of of God's family and the human family, I need to have the right. I have the right to be fed, and with the food that nourishes my mind and body. In other words, if I support support, sorry, the whole idea of the Eucharistic food as food for the journey, and symbolizes real food. I support the sharing of our resources 
so that all may have enough to support and sustain right life. If you don't, then you go along with multinationals, you go along with conglomerates, that their only concern is to how much money they can make out of their products. Finally, confirmation. The Holy Spirit came down upon the apostles and they began to speak. This gives me the right to have equality. As a member of the human race, I understand and accept my brothers and sisters as equals, regardless of race, color, creed, sex, or national origin. Uh, and that is true around the world. And we see in some countries that the rights of women are limited or don't even exist. Rights of children are hampered. That's not right. Everybody has the right of equality, man, women, and children. And if you support that, then you are respecting the dignity of the human person. And if you're against that, then you are supporting repression, oppression, racism that dictate to others. In the sacraments of healing, reconciliation, uh, and anointing of the sick. Reconciliation is receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive sins, they are forgiven. If you hold them bound, they are held bound. Now keep that in mind. That's something that I'm very conscious. If you, even a lay person, holds on to the mistakes of others again, and you're not willing to forgive them, uh, you have a problem. So the sacrament of reconciliation is the right to individual differences and culture. As members of the human family, I have the right to be accepted for my uniqueness given me by God and my culture given to me by my birth and enables me to live in peace with others. When you support that right to individual differences, you are working for peaceful existence of all people in the world and in the body of Christ. If you do not support it, you wind up making judgmental attitudes and attacks on people for no reason whatsoever. Finally, the anointing of the sick. Is there anyone among you sick? Let them ask for the priests of the church. They in turn are to pray over them, anointing them with oil in the name of the Lord Jesus. This is the right to human dignity and equal rights. As a member of the human race, family, I have a right to treat others and to be treated fairly, regardless of my limitations, for we all share a common faith that does justice. Notice the previous sacrament of reconciliation deals with peace. This sacrament of the anointing of the sick and all of what it represents is justice. And if I respect the dignity and equality of all people without judgment or limitations, I am fulfilling the desire of the human rights of others. If I regret them, work against them, I support neglect, poor treatment of the sick, the handicapped, and the elderly. Now we come to the last two sacraments, the sacrament of vocation. Marriage. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and cling to his wife, and the two shall become as one. We have the right to relationships and belonging and community. As members of the human family, I have the right to exercise my free will and freedom and my choice of a partner, state of life, work that contributes to my growth, and that of community in which I am a part in response to God's call. One of the things I remember as vocation director is talking to some young people who were told by the family, you must be this, you must do that. Or, and something which I never believed was happening until uh, I discovered it, that there was times when some young people would say, 
that their parents told them if they left the seminary because they did not want to be a priest, they were not to return home. I found that very difficult, but I know that that has happened. And it's denying the person the right to a relationship and to make their own choices about who and what they will become in the world today. And if you support that, you support truth and honesty in making real and genuine decisions that affect my life and after prudent reflection and counseling. That's very important that these decisions about life, how I'm to live it, what I'm to do, must be done with prudent reflection and counsel. If not, you wind up serving oneself. In other words, become very selfish, and that's not a very good thing. Finally, holy orders, priesthood. Right to serve the needy, alienated, marginalized, and poor in the name of Jesus. This too, like the previous sacrament, requires the exercise of free will and freedom in the choice of state of life. And we are all invited to be part of that family of God that assists each other in becoming the kind of person that God, not somebody else, but God wants us to be. And if you support that, then you support the free choice of a lifestyle that is countercultural, as did Jesus. In other words, you may choose. People say to me, I don't understand why so-and-so is going off to the missions. They have a lot of talent. They can make a lot of money and be more prominent. And that's unfortunately a characteristic of the society in which we are living. To be countercultural means to do what you feel with consultation that God is calling you to do. I'm always amazed at the young men and women who I have counseled over the years who have joined uh, things like the Peace Corps, uh, Vista, or have gone off to foreign lands as priests and missionaries. I think that's extraordinary, and that is responding to a very special gift to them by God. And it takes that phrase of the liturgy, do this in remembrance of me. When Jesus gave the apostles the bread and wine as his body and blood, he said, do this in memory of me. So when I bring the good news of Christ to my own people, to a foreign land, to uh, very learned people and people that are not so learned, I am doing what Jesus says. I am remembering him and I am remembering the person in light of Christ. I support this free choice of life style, and to be counterculture like Jesus. If you don't support that choice of process, you, uh, you take the notion of happiness of, as riches, power, and privilege. Uh, you, in, in fact, that's how you abuse the gifts that God has given you, the ability to uh, help others is tied up with the ability to uh, understand what it means to serve other people and to be with them in all aspects of their life. So there it is. The seven sacraments are part of our journey of holiness. In fact, in leaving out the sacraments, we become holier than we can sometimes even realize. But the holiness comes from doing uh, what each sacrament invites us to do. And to do it freely and without judgment and without reserve. So again, I just want to remind you that Jesus touches our ears to hear God's word 
and our mouth to proclaim it in faith. He also tells us in the Eucharist, that's baptism, he also tells us in the Eucharist to do this in memory of me. This means that I become Christ to others in love, in service, and in caring. And receiving the Holy Spirit in confirmation enables me to use the gifts of the Spirit in ministry and service of others. And then, at times, and very often, we need to go in peace, proclaim the word that's wonderful works of God, who brought us salvation through the sacrament of penance, through healing. We uh, acquire a new sense of peace and new sense of mission in our lives. And finally, through the sacrament of the sick, we bring people to eternal life, first promised to them in baptism. In the mission field, in work that you do for others, you are a sign and symbol of the gift of baptism and assisting the sick. You are a sign to them of the fulfillment of promises of baptism that Jesus is with them until the end of time. And then in fulfilling your vocation, you use your vocation, whether it's marriage or whether it's holy orders or the single life, in order to serve people in the name of Christ Jesus, in persona Christi, be with Jesus now and forever. Lord God, we give you thanks for these gifts of the sacraments. May we appreciate them always in our daily lives. May we call upon them as we need in the living out of uh, your mission that I have responded to. And may they assist me in the times of distress, sorrow, sickness, and even death as I prepare to journey in holiness to the kingdom of God forever and ever. How long was that?